and welcome to this episode where we're talking all about night wakings. There are so many different reasons for night wakings, but today we're going to explore one particular thing that could be causing night wakings for your little one, and that is parasomnias. What on earth are they? Stick around, I'm going to explain exactly what they are, why they happen, how you can respond to them, and how you can prevent them. So don't forget to hit the notifications so you know when I release another one of these episodes because I have so many great tips coming up like this for you every single week. Right, so let's delve in to parasomnias. It's a funny old word, isn't it? And actually, it comes from para, meaning alongside of, and the Latin noun of somnus, which means sleep. It's something that happens alongside sleep, basically. So what is it? What are they? What are parasomnias? You will have heard of them in their individual little forms. Things like sleep talking, sleep walking. Um, you may have heard of night terrors or sleep terrors. Those are all part of the parasomnia family. And what they really are, what it really is, um, what it really means is a movement or behavior in sleep. That's the easiest way to explain it. And things like sleep walking actually are pretty hereditary. They, it runs in families. So if you were a sleepwalker, maybe your child will be. Um, don't be surprised if you see that, as it does run along in families. So that's kind of an idea as to what they are and the, the group they belong to. Um, the sleepwalking, it's walking in sleep. It's getting up out of bed and physically walking around. And talking, it's talking or making noises in your sleep. But the one that I think needs a little more explanation is sleep terrors or night terrors. And um, because a lot of parents think their child ha is having them and maybe they are, maybe they're not. So it's good to understand what they actually even are. And they are not bad dreams or nightmares or severe bad dreams or terror, like that kind of thing. That's a dream and it's something that you wake up from and you can recall it. You can remember it if you try hard enough. It, the brain can recall it. Whereas a sleep terror or night terror, whilst it can come across similarly in the moment, so you can see, you know, um, upset words or thrashing around, like, you know, looks, it looks like someone's in a really bad dream. It's actually not um, the same. It's not the same place. They're actually in a state of somewhere between awake and asleep. They're in a very deep sleep, but there, there's an awake element to it as well. It's, it, I'm not going to go into the science right now, but what you'll see in terms of the difference is a bad dream or a nightmare is, no, oh my God, it's awful, it's awful, I'm awake, as opposed to a little one who looks like they are awake. They already look awake, you know, with a night terror or a sleep terror, or actually the milder version that we tend to see in the younger ones is, is typically called a confusional arousal. And it can still be a little bit upsetting or distressing in, in terms of their behavior, but it's not quite as terrifying in terms of how they behave, but it is still very odd. They can be as mild as sitting up and looking around and looking for something and being confused and then going back to sleep, hopefully. And the thing with those confusional arousals, sleep terrors, night terrors, that kind of thing, is they will look or can look as though they are awake. And parents often describe it as like, they look like they're possessed. <laughs> and it's because they will, if you approach them, they might look like they're looking right through you and, and you're kind of like, they don't recognize me. And maybe aren't responding to you. They're not um, maybe responding to you, trying to comfort them or anything like that. So that's what those can be, those episodes can be. So how do you respond to them? That's the thing, all of these parasomnias, how do you respond to them? So the, the key thing is not to try to jolt or shake or wake a person from a parasomnia. Um, it, it would be really confusing for them, it could be upsetting, or you could actually just become a part of all of the confusion that they're in. And you just, you just become a form, uh, a figure that's in that weird world they're in right now in their mind, if you think of it like that. Um, it's better not to, but instead to monitor them. So with children, especially with little ones, monitor that they're not gonna hurt themselves, that they're not getting into physical difficulty, because if they are thrashing about or walking or moving around, they, they could injure themselves. So safety primarily is the thing you're looking out for. And if they're walking and if they're of an age that they can get up and out of bed and they're walking, guide them back nicely without really, inter don't try to interact, just sway and guide them back. And they'll subconsciously have this, you're there, but you're not really there. 
Um, if it's talking, I just honestly, I would let it go and, and let, them, let them talk, let them chat away in their sleep, it's really not a problem. If it's a night terror, if they're shouting out, no, 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 frustrated, or anything that is um, disturbing, again, monitor, watch them. If you can watch either from a baby monitor, video camera, or um, from a crack in the door, just to make sure they're okay, but hold back. And if they are okay, just hold back, don't intervene, let the episode pass. Like I said, you can't exactly comfort them, it doesn't really work. I've tried this myself, by the way. My son um, was prone to having some of these when he was in the sort of toddler preschooler age. And uh, I, so I know firsthand what it feels like as a parent to experience a child having one of these. Um, it is uh, it's really bizarre. And it can be quite upsetting. Sometimes it can be funny, but sometimes they can be upsetting. Um, so hold back and try not to, try not to stimulate or uh, engage with the child, but if you can steer them and keep them safe, that's great. And you know, again, with sleepwalking, so my youngest actually has done a bit of that, and um, I know if she's come downstairs of an evening, and I, you know, which is really, really rare for either of my children to ever do that, but if she does, I almost immediately know, and I'm like, she's, I've even looked at her, looked at my husband and gone, she's not awake, and I'll go, come on, go to bed, and I'll walk with her and tuck her in. And in the morning, when I ask her about it, she has no memory of it. And it's because it was a parasomnia. Um, it's, yeah, that, that's kind of a nice, a nice kind where it's not really upsetting, and she's even laughed about that in the morning. So we've looked at what they are, and we've talked about how to respond or not to respond to them, how to deal with them in the moment. And rest assured, they will usually pass quite quickly. And it's good to know that they typically happen in the first half of the night, less often in the second half of the night. So usually you can deal with it before you're having your lovely deep sleep. But what can you do to actually prevent it? How can you stop them? How can you stop them? Well, like I said, sometimes it can be hereditary anyway, and so it is part, part of their um, genetic makeup and, and a tendency that they may have. However, that tendency is far more likely to show itself if they're overtired. I say this about everything, and if you've watched my other videos or followed me for a while, you'll understand that I'm always talking about overtiredness because it is absolutely the root of large, a large proportion of sleep challenges with little ones. But overtiredness is, is a reason you're gonna to start to see these. So if your child has them a lot, I would question how much sleep are they getting overall? Are they getting, if they should be getting daytime sleep, are they, and are they getting enough? If they're past the age of daytime napping, how else could they be getting more rest? Are they going to bed too late? Or is bedtime all over the place? Could we bring that earlier and make it consistent? Um, look for, I would say spot it. You've got to spot it, then you've got it. And where is it that they could be getting overtired? Where are we um, depleting? And where can we, where can we top up and replenish that sleep? Because usually um, once we overcome overtiredness, we stop seeing these episodes. So that's what they are, how to handle them when they happen and things that you can do to try to prevent them. Parasomnias, guys, they are bizarre, but they are very real, they happen, and uh, let's see if we can avoid that being something that creates disturbance in your child's sleep, because if they're prone to having these parasomnias, it's disturbing their sleep. Every time they're having one, it is a, it's a disturbance, and it's interrupting their sleep, and it will slightly diminish the quality of night sleep. So. I hope that's helped and given you a brilliant education on parasomnias today. One of the many reasons for night wakings. Stand by for my next episode where I'm going to be talking about night wakings in the sense of how to respond to them. So we're going to explore in-depth responding to night wakings. I'll catch you in the next episode. Take care. See you soon. Thanks so much for watching. If you've liked anything about this episode, then please leave a comment below and hit subscribe for more episodes like this. If any of your friends would benefit from seeing this video, then please do share it with them using the hashtag TheSleepNanny. And we look forward to seeing you again real soon.